ever heard the idiom, the statement, blood is thicker than water? You know, we often hear it in, in mafia movies. You know, it's all about loyalty to the family and, and putting those people ahead of anything else in life, ahead of any other priority. In our culture, we often use it, not necessarily in a mafia kind of way, but to mean that, that family bonds and relations are, are more important and stronger than temporary social bonds. Or, or another way that we have a stronger obligation to people we're related to by blood than to people who we simply are acquaintances with or people within our community. In our culture, it might be spoken, you might hear it in a different kind of phraseology. It might sound something like, she'd do anything for her sister. He would go to hell and back for his brother. You know, it's the kind of thing we, we see in movies and TV shows where people will sacrifice anything and everything for family. But if I'm, honest, if I'm being honest with you, I think that this idiom has lost some of its power in our culture because we're a very individualistic society. And not that we don't care about family, but we value people being able to pull themselves up by their bootstraps, to, to rise from their circumstances and, and leave behind all the, the things that might hold them back and, and sacrifice anything to achieve their dreams, that that might be the, the ultimate goal. But in a culture, a, a culture of, of shame and honor, a society kind of like Japan, a statement like this means an awful lot more. Because for them, the idea of honoring your, your father and your mother, your elders, is considered paramount. It might be, it might be the most important commandment in, in their cultural context. And so bringing shame or dishonor on your family is one of the, the worst things you can do. The same is true of Middle Eastern culture. And it was especially true in Jesus' time. You see, it was a patriarchal society. Who you were was based on who your family was and their position in society, which generally meant who your father was and his position or role in society in, that low, in the town. And so, you see, Jesus' parents, and his, or his mom and his brothers, they'd noticed a change in Jesus. Since he'd gone to the waters of baptism, to John's baptism in the Jordan, and we know that the Holy Spirit entered into him, but suddenly he wasn't just being a carpenter. He was out preaching the good news. He was ruffling a lot of feathers. So they came out and they wanted to have an intervention. They wanted to have an intervention in Jesus' life. They wanted to, to get things back in order, you know, set things right. Jesus, you're, you're ruffling a lot of feathers out there. You're starting to make it hard for us in our community. The religious leaders, they're not very happy with what you're saying right now. So they came out. It wasn't innocent action. They came out to protect their reputation. They came out and they were going to bring Jesus home and they were going to set him straight. They were going to get him on the straight and narrow. And so we'd expect the story immediately after this first part of the gospel to continue with when his mother and brothers arrive. But you see, in Mark's gospel, stories are often interrupted. And it's important to pay attention when that happens because the interruptions often give us the, the background information we need to know to understand what's really going on, what's really happening in this situation. And so we get the scene, and the scribes come onto the scene, and and they don't think Jesus is just out of his mind like his family. No, no, no. He's been doing these things because he's in the power of evil spirits. He's been possessed by Beelzebub, which is another word for Satan. You know, it's another name of Satan that means household, Lord of the household or Lord of the, the dwelling. And they come out and they say, Jesus is doing these healings. He is casting out the demons. He is forgiving sins. I mean, the audacity of the guy to think that he can take God's place and forgive sins. He's doing it because he's possessed by Satan. He is possessed in the evil spirits. And so they, they start uttering all these things against him. You're in league with Satan. That's how you're doing all these things to Jesus. And that's when Jesus stops and he hears their accusation. And then he says a parable about households and dwellings and, and reigns and kingdoms. If a kingdom is divided against itself, it can't stand. And if a house is divided against itself, it cannot stand. If both of these are true, and, and they seem to be true statements, then if Satan is fighting against himself, then his kingdom cannot stand. You, you accuse me 
of being in league with Satan. But I'm coming out here and I'm, I'm casting out demons. I'm, I'm doing things that are opposed to his kingdom. You see, Satan is the strong man in this parable. And Jesus is coming out and he's exerting his authority. He's proving he is the, the stronger man, the man with greater authority, who's coming in and, and tearing apart Satan's household. He's binding up the strong man. He's casting out the demons. He's getting rid of the effects of, of sin that have caused the, the, the illnesses. He is proclaiming the good news of God's good and gracious reign. He's doing all these things. He's, he hasn't come in league with Satan. No, he's an opposing household, an opposing kingdom that has come to overthrow Satan's reign. And so he's bound up Satan. Satan hasn't been done away with yet. It's not the final judgment. But he has come and he's bound up Satan. After Jesus tells this parable, the, the gospel continues with one of the most misunderstood and misused passages in Scripture. You know, he says that people can be forgiven all of their sins and every slander they utter, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. They are guilty of an eternal sin. Wait, what? What is it? What is Jesus talking about? What does this mean? Well, remember that the stories in the middle of, of these stories are trying to give us information about the context of what's really going on. Remember, Jesus' parents had come, and his, or his mom had come, and his brothers had come, and they had misunderstood Jesus. They had spoken against Jesus. They had blasphemed Jesus even. I mean, accusing him of, having an, of being out of his mind when he's really the son of God. But sin, or speaking against the son of man can be forgiven because they've misunderstood who he was. But we do know that because we have the rest of the gospel and acts that his family would come to believe in who he was that they would understand that he was the truly son of God. But the scribes, however, you see, they had seen Jesus' miracles. They had heard his teaching. They had heard him forgive sins and proclaim the good and gracious reign of God that had come. And they say that he's doing this in the power of an unclean spirit. He's not representing God. No, no, no. He's representing Satan. He is, he is in league with Satan. That's how he's doing these things. They're accusing him of being in league with Satan. They're rejecting the great, good and gracious reign of God that has come in Jesus Christ. They're rejecting the salvation that Christ brings. That's all this is really talking about, is an ongoing, continuous rejection of God's grace and salvation offered in Jesus Christ. There's nothing more complex than that. There's nothing, nothing more than that. It's that if you continually reject the salvation God offers and the forgiveness God offers, how can you really be forgiven? You rejected the offer. And so the, the whole point of this, of this statement is that it, it's an ongoing rejection. is the only thing that can really separate you from God's love. But I, I want to make something clear right now. It's not our job to decide who has accepted and who hasn't, who is in and who's not in God's kingdom. That's God's job. He's the only judge. Our job as Christians is to go out and proclaim the good and gracious reign and the salvation offered in Jesus Christ and let God's spirit and God's word do the work in their lives and hopefully bring them to faith in him. I mean, that's, that's the point of this. You know, as, again, this gospel, it seems to go all over the place, the lesson today, but as it finally returns to the story and Jesus' family arrives, they, they get to the scene and they send in somebody to talk to Jesus. But it's kind of ironic. You see, they stand outside of the house, both literally, they're physically outside of the house that Jesus is in, and metaphorically, right now, they're outside of God's kingdom because they have not accepted who Jesus is. And so they send a messenger in to Jesus. You know, your mother and your brothers are here and they want to speak to you. They want to see you. Jesus hears the message and he looks around at those, probably not sitting in chairs like you, but, you know, surrounding him in this way. And he says, these people who are here listening to my words, who are hearing the word of God and, and seeking to follow, this is my true family. These are my true brothers, my true sisters, my true mother. It's not my biological family that defines my true family. I mean, those were shocking and offensive words then, and they're shocking and offensive still today. But it was true for Jesus and who his true family was, and it's true for us as well. You see, our family, our true family, has been defined by the waters of baptism. You see, blood is not thicker than water, no. The waters of baptism are stronger and more powerful than any bond that blood could ever create. It is an eternal family, an eternal claim on who you are and who you belong to. 
Jesus is in this scene and his family, I think they get there and they finally realize that for Jesus, biological family has become secondary. That doesn't mean they're not important. But his, he's no longer one of Mary's boys. You see, his disciples aren't simply roadies or companions or a fan club. No, they're partners. They're his true family in the ministry of God, in, in his ministry, because they hear his word and they obey. They follow. You see, the, the words that Jesus spoke that when he said that this is, these are my true brothers and sisters and mother, he would have uttered the same words about those of us gathered here today because we hear his word and we seek to follow. We follow where he would lead us. You know, for Jesus, when it comes to God, there cannot be a close second. It's not God and something else. God, God, for Jesus, God is the only priority. Everything else falls in line behind that. Everything that Jesus does is centered in God. It's not, you know, I have my little God part of the pie chart of my day. Everything was, was centered in God for Jesus Christ. And, and the same is true for us. But you see, I, I don't want to leave this, this story and let you think that, that this must have been an easy thing for Jesus to do because I don't think saying the, the reality at that moment that his brothers and his mother were outside of his true family, that they no longer belonged to the household he belonged to was easy for him. I, I think it must have broken his heart because he, as far as we know, his childhood, he wasn't abused. He wasn't sold into slavery like Joseph. He, he didn't have a bad childhood, but they no longer we're following the same God that he followed, at least not at that moment. But the reality is it, it, was, it must have torn Jesus' heart apart. And so often for us, it, it tears our hearts apart because for many of us, our biological family is not in the kingdom of God, at least not all of it. I mean, some of us might be blessed and our whole family might be in the kingdom of God, might be in that household. But even if they are, you know, often when we come to a deeper and greater understanding of God's call and claim upon our lives, it's often our family that reacts the harshest against us, that, that has the biggest struggle with the change that happens in our lives. But, you know, it's, and I know that, that we, many of us have divided biological homes, and it's really painful. It's really painful to have people within our family that, that aren't necessarily in the same boat that we're in. You know, we, we struggle with children who, who don't know the, the love of God, who, who don't understand why we believe what we believe, who have left this fold. We have brothers and sisters who can't understand why you would leave or sacrifice anything to follow Christ, why you would give up any benefit you have to follow where Christ would lead you. We have maybe husbands or wives who don't understand why when Sunday's your only day off, why you still want to go to worship when isn't family most important? And we have people who, who it breaks our hearts to know have never experienced the true peace that can be found in Christ alone. I, I know it breaks my heart when I realize that people don't understand what I mean when I say that I would follow Jesus Christ anywhere. I would give up anything for him. I would go to hell and back if that's what he asked of me because of who he is, because of what he has done, because of the love and life he has given me. It has placed a demand and a claim upon my life. And there's nothing I wouldn't give back to him because everything I am belongs to him, belongs to the one true God. You know, I don't have divided allegiances, or at least I try not to live that way anymore. As, as singer-songwriter Derek Webb put it in one of his songs, see, my first allegiance is, is not to a flag, a country, or a man. No, my first allegiance is not to democracy or blood. It's to a king and a kingdom. My first allegiance is to Christ and the kingdom of God that he has brought here, that he has brought me into. That's where, where my first allegiance lies. Everything I am belongs to him. You know, as Romans 6 says, thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you have come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. The reality for us is that we are either in the household of Satan and are slaves to sin, or we are in the household in the kingdom of Jesus and God and we are slaves to righteousness. There is no in-between. There is no gray area. There is no divided allegiance. It's not waiting till the end to see how it plays out. You're either with God and Jesus Christ or you are against him. There is no other place to be standing. As as Tolian Chavigian, the, the, the grandson of the great evangelist Billy Graham, put it in a, a wonderful book. 
titled Jesus plus nothing equals everything. And that's, that's the equation he uses. My allegiance, my hope for salvation and everything I have, all my hope is placing Christ alone. It's not Jesus and money. It's not Jesus and family. It's not Jesus and democracy or America or Canada. It's not Jesus and my hard works. It's not Jesus and my good works. My hope and my allegiance and everything I have, I'm placing Christ alone. And that's the same place where you place your hope. That's the only place where we have assurance, where we have identity, where we have security, where we know that we can belong to God's kingdom. You see, Jesus Christ has, has come and through his blood, he has opened wide the gates of heaven. And as we are baptized, we can enter into that household and it's open for all. You know, as the, the great gospel is proclaimed in John 3, 16 and 17, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son and whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. That salvation is offered to all of us. And it's offered freely. But we have to accept it. We have to trust that Jesus is our only hope of salvation. And as we come to that knowledge, as we come to understand what that means for our lives, we, we come into the kingdom by the, the waters and the word, by the spirit in baptism. We are brought into God's kingdom and his claim is placed upon us. And it is a claim that is stronger than any blood tie, that is more powerful than any force of hell. It is stronger than, than anything in all of this world and in the spiritual world. You see, Satan might, might be only bound for now and, and isn't done away with, but he has no authority over you. As Luther said in the, the hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, one small word can fell him. That word is Jesus. We have, uh, we belong to his kingdom. And that word gives us security. And we, can, we dwell in that kingdom and that gives us life, that gives us hope, and it gives us freedom to know that no accusation that Satan can bring against us can separate us from God's love. You are his child. He has placed his claim upon you. When you entered into the waters of baptism and you were baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, that was a claim into his household that is irrevocable. It cannot be taken from you. No matter what comes in this life, the most true thing about you is that you are his, that you are a son or a daughter of God, and nothing can separate you from his hand. You are loved. You are forgiven. You are free. Amen.